Good afternoon, everyone. This is Carol Scott with the National Ombudsman Resource Center, or NORC. Thanks for joining in this webinar for local representatives on the topic of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Rule, Ombudsman Program Representative Advocacy, Training, and Program Management, looking at Individual Conflict of Interest, or COI. This webinar will dig a bit deeper into individual COIs and introduce training resources on this topic. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be on the NORC website, ltcombudsman.org, later this week, along with all of the handouts. You will also find the handouts in the toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen. And we sent those out to everyone who is registered. Um, we've built in time for questions and answers, so please type any questions into the toolbox. Katie, would you please open the first poll? We would like to know um, who's with us today. So are you located in the state ombudsman office, in a local ombudsman entity, or not an ombudsman? And like I mentioned, um, we did send the handouts earlier, or you can get them over on the right-hand side um, in the toolbox. So Katie, what, is the, what are the results of the poll? And could you read them, please? Katie, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 18% are in the state ombudsman office, 78% are in a local ombudsman office, and 3% are not ombudsmen. Okay, great. Well, we're glad to have everyone with us. Um, open up the second poll, and that is asking if you are an ombudsman program representative for more than 10 years, from 5 to 10 years, two to five years, less than two years, or not applicable. Um, when the webinar ends today, you will be receiving an evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to provide feedback so that we can continue providing quality webinars. OK, Katie, let's close this one up. 29% um, have been representatives for more than 10 years. 17% have been representatives for more than 5 to 10 years. 26% have been representatives for 2 to 5 years. 24% have been representatives for less than 2 years. And 4% chose not applicable. Great. Thank you all. Well, such a wide spread of knowledge and people coming in new. Um, uh, we're hoping that the information that's provided today is helpful to all of you. Today's speakers are Sarah Hunt. Sarah is a, a served as a served as a consultant, trainer, and product developer for NORC and the National Association of State Ombudsman Programs since 1987. She's a geriatric social worker and received her master's in social work. She is a former Louisiana State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Our second speaker is Louise Ryan. Louise currently serves as Ombudsman Program Specialist for the U.S. Administration for Community Living Administration on Aging. Her primary duties include providing technical assistance to states on policy interpretation of the Older Americans Act and Ombudsman Program rule regarding operations of the long-term care Ombudsman programs. Prior to coming to AOA, Louise was the Washington State Long-Term Care Ombudsman for nearly five years after having served as the assistant state ombudsman for nine years. Our third speaker is Patty Ducaye. Patty is a licensed master social worker, and she has served as the Texas State Long-Term Care Ombudsman since the beginning of 2007. Nate, Patty is currently the president of NASOP. Our final speaker is Stacy Primo. Stacy is a certified ombudsman specialist and program director of Advocates for Basic Legal Equalities Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program in Toledo, Ohio. Stacy has worked with the ombudsman program for 19 years since its inception with ABLE in 1998. 
He earned a Bachelor of Science in Social Work and is a licensed social worker in the state of Ohio. Her program covers 10 counties in Northwest Ohio. And thanks to Katie Kohler, Program and Communications Associate with NORC for handling the technical side of the webinar and to Amity Overall Lab, NORC's director. I'll now turn the webinar over to Sarah Hunt. Sarah? Thank you, Carol. So I think my slides are up and we're in business. And thanks to all of you for tuning in, as well as to our presenters today. I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations as well as the questions and answers and discussion myself. So what we're going to try to do in the next 65 minutes that we have remaining is to give everyone a better understanding of the individual conflicts of interest provisions in the long-term care ombudsman program rule, to learn about ombudsman program policies, processes, and tools that we now have to identify and address some of the conflicts of interest, and also to gain some new ideas by applying the provisions in the rule to some specific situations. And how many situations we get through today will kind of depend on how robust the questions and discussion are. Quickly, the agenda for today is Louise Ryan is going to cover the individual conflict of interest provisions in the rule. And then using that platform as our foundation, Patty will talk about some of the processes and forms for individual conflict of interest screening for identifying and approving remedies or satisfactorily removing any conflicts of interest and how they do that in Texas. And they have made some recent changes as a result of the rule. And then Stacy will share with us how they are using conflict of interest tools and processes in this Ohio program, as well as some examples of how those processes have really come in handy. The materials that both presenters will be discussing are available as handout forms, and we'll also post them on the NORC website with the materials for this webinar. Then we'll have some time for open questions and discussion. You can type your questions in the chat. You can let us know that you want to speak. We may be able to get through one or two sample situations for whether or not you think they're conflict of interest and followed by discussion, and a quick overview of key resources and resources that soon will be coming, as well as wrap up of today's discussion. And with that, I am happy to turn it over to Louise for your presentation. Thanks, Louise. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will, uh, let me see here, can you see my screen? I hope. Yes, you, yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great, okay. Um, all right, well, I'll get started. Um, so just in detail, I'm going to dig not only into what the conflicts of interest say, but some of the other provisions of the rule. Um, I can't get my uh, slide to forward. Hmm. Okay, I'll keep trying. That is so strange. Um, hmm. so I'm having click a on inside your, inside your PowerPoint slide and then try again. Oh, okay, thank you. Hmm. I'm not sure what my, oh, there we go. Something was haywire. Boy, my apologies. Okay. It worked before when we practiced. Um, so I'm going to talk not, not only about individual conflicts of interest as described in the rule, but also some backdrop in the rule related to definitions and policies and procedure requirements. Um, of the Ombudsman rule. So with that, um, just some backdrop. You know, the goal of the rule, the kind of overarching goal that we had when this rule was developed was to promote high quality Ombudsman services for residents. Um, you know, credible person-centered problem solvers who work with and for residents and also having the effective astute ad advocates for resident-centered systems change in long-term services and supports. So it's really important that we have clarity um, with the, in the rule and that, that the rule supports the effectiveness and credibility of the 
program in several ways, including looking at both organizational and individual conflicts of interest. Um, those, there are provisions in the Older Americans Act that, addr that address organizational and individual conflicts of interest, but the rule more specifically lays out some steps, in particular requiring ombudsman programs to avoid conflicts of interest. And when there are conflicts, that when they are identified, that they are remedied or removed. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, just again, some definitions that are in the long-term care ombudsman rule. We have immediate family as it pertains to conflicts of interest, means a member of the household or a relative with whom there is a close personal or significant financial relationship. So when looking at conflicts of interest, you have to consider immediate family. Um, also just, um, and I'm sure you've probably heard this before, but when we talk about representatives of the office, we are talking about employees or volunteers who are designated by the ombudsman to fulfill the duties set forth in the act and the rule in terms of what you might think of as a local ombudsman uh, representative or a volunteer ombudsman. Uh, the technical term in the rule is representatives of the office and the uh, definition of state long-term care ombudsman or ombudsman with a capital O means the individual who is responsible personally or through representatives of the office to fulfill the functions, responsibilities, and duties set forth in the rule. And so when I use the word ombudsman, I'm talking about the state ombudsman. The rule doesn't use terms like local ombudsman or volunteer ombudsman. Um, but it is not um, prohibited at your state level to use the word ombudsman to describe staff and volunteers. You don't have to change that term, but just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, okay, so the rule also requires policies and procedures, and it lays out several different types of policies and procedures. Uh, the one today we're focusing on is conflicts of interest. And it requires that no individual or member of the immediate family who appoints the ombudsman or employs the ombudsman is subject to a conflict of interest. It requires that other agencies, either in which the office or the local ombudsman entity is located, that they have policies in place to prohibit the employment or appointment of an ombudsman or representative of the office when that conflict cannot be adequately re removed or remedied. The policy and procedure also requires that the ombudsman take reasonable steps to refuse, suspend, or remove designation of an individual who has a conflict or who's a member of their immediate family has a conflict that can't be adequately removed or remedied, and that there are methods by which the office um, or the state agency will review and identify conflicts of the ombudsman and representatives of the office, and that there's actions that the office um, or the state agency will require of the ombudsman or representatives of the office to take in order to remedy or remove conflicts. So all that needs to be spelled out in a policy and procedure, and Patty's going to describe how that works um, in her state, so you'll get kind of a real live example of that. One thing I should also mention where the rule talks about state agency, that means the state unit on aging. And depending on the state, some states delegate all the development of policies and procedures to the ombudsman. Other states say they want to do it or they do it in, and they do it in coordination with the state ombudsman, but it kind of depends on the state. That's why when you see this development of policies and procedures, it's kind of a and or um, in terms of how policies and procedures are developed. So uh, the rule also requires that the state ombudsman has uh, the function to designate and there are policies and procedures related to designation that establishes the process by which the ombudsman shall designate and refuse, suspend, or remove designation 
of local, not only local entities, but in this case, representatives of the office, and that the criteria should include um, the ability to refuse or suspend uh, designation in situations in which an identified conflict of interest can't be adequately removed or remedied. So that's the backdrop. I just wanted to pull that in before we looked more specifically at the conflicts of interest. And what are those conflicts of interest? We've got a list in the rule and also further instruction that says the state agency and the ombudsman must consider conflicts of interest that can impact the effectiveness and credibility um, for both the ombudsman and representatives of the office and members of their immediate family. So the list here is what's in the rule, um, so direct involvement in licensing or certifying of a long-term care facility, ownership or investment interest in a long-term care facility, employment by or management by a long-term care facility in the service area, um, the receipt of or right to receive remuneration from a facility, accepting gifts or gratuities of significant value, accepting money or other consideration from anyone other than an entity approved by the ombudsman for performing program duties, serving as a guardian or surrogate decision maker for a resident of a long-term care facility in the service area, and serving residents of a facility in which an immediate family member resides. Um, so those are what are kind of the basics in terms of identifying individual conflicts of interest. And I'll also talk a little bit more about other situations that aren't on this list, but that could impact the effectiveness and credibility. So, so basically, there's the process to identify. And then the second step would be, can these be removed or remedied? What, how, do, how do you address them? So there are some that can't be remedied. They have to be removed. So the prohibited conflicts, the ones that must be removed, is an individual who has direct involvement in licensing, surveying, or certifying long-term care facilities, or who has ownership, operational, or investment interest in a facility, uh, one who's been employed by or participating in the management of a long-term care facility, for the state ombudsman, for a new state ombudsman, they cannot have, within the previous 12 months, been employed by or participated in the management of a long-term care facility. And that's a big shift that happened in the rule. Um, it, there used to be, it was, there was silence on this issue. Um, but it was determined that there needed to be a cooling off period for the state ombudsman, that they didn't come direct from the industry into the role of state ombudsman, that there needed to be a little bit of time. Um, for representatives of the office, there is no federal requirement for a cooling off period, but they can't be currently employed by a long-term care facility. Um, some states have uh, further restrictions. They might say it's a one-year cooling off period for all representatives of the office and the state ombudsman. Um, so it depends on your state if there's further restrictions there. Another prohibited conflict is to, um, receiving or the right to receive um, fun, money or remuneration from a long-term care facility or its management. Um, one other thing I would say about having representatives of the office who come from direct from uh, the industry, if that happens in your state or if that's allowed, is how do you address those conflicts? Like if they were employed at a nursing home and so you want to make sure, for instance, that they don't have any interaction with that nursing home. You might also say if that nursing home is owned by a chain that they don't uh, have any interaction with any facilities of that chain. And then you have to consider in determining is this the right fit for the program to bring this person on, 
is that going to really restrict their ability to fulfill the duties needed if there's, say, a lot of facilities in that region uh, owned by that chain? Is that going to be too restrictive? So those are, you know, things that have to be considered when looking at bringing somebody into the program who is coming, you know, directly from the industry without a cooling off period, or even if they, you know, were previously employed, you still want to look at that, even if it was a year or two ago. That's still something to consider. Um, so just to summarize, um, when you're considering um, employing or appointing either the ombudsman or the representative of the office, the employing entity shall avoid unremedied conflicts of interest and establish a process for periodic review, identification, and removal or remedy. And the ombudsman or the state unit, through their policies, must ensure that no ombudsman or representative of the office are required or permitted to hold positions or perform duties that would constitute a conflict of interest. And I'd say a common example we've had of, uh, with that one is um, wanting the, say, the state ombudsman to be both in charge of the ombudsman program and in charge of adult protective services. That is a conflict that, because of ombudsman disclosure requirements, just the way the program works compared to adult protective services, uh, they're complementary, but to try to and to try to be in charge of both, which also raises other issues about the ombudsman being full time, and um, but that's one where that would uh, constitute a conflict, and we would not um, expect to see that from a state. Um, other things that programs need to consider, um, in addition to what's on the list, um, are other things that might impact the effectiveness and the credibility of the program. Um, so I just want to just spend a moment on screening when you're looking at whether it's paid staff or volunteer. Not only what you have on paper in your forms to disclose conflicts, but when interviewing that person um, and evaluating, you might need to look at things like other professions that might require some additional attention and potential remedies. And some examples I have is, say, somebody who, whose uh, side job is holding estate sales or um, people who sell insurance or uh, maybe people who sell real estate. Nothing inherently wrong with those people coming on, but you have to kind of explore, do they have any motivations that might be conflicting, like they want to build their base of potential clients, you know, so it's something to um, consider. Um, some other things to think about, and this I know is a challenge in rural areas, is where you've got you know, the one nursing home in town, and it's a small town, and everybody knows everybody, and so you've got relatives who might work there. Um, you could have a close friend who works there, so maybe technically um, that's not a conflict, but it's wise to kind of inquire um, about other relationships sometimes, and that could be more um, either during an interview or, you know, kind of a other. There are other things that you might want to tell us about yourself when you're, you know, looking to bring somebody on in terms of other relationships or friendships. Um, and I know how challenging that is in, in rural areas. Um, other conflicts I've been aware of is a uh, local ombudsman uh, representative who uh, works 15 hours a week as adult protective service investigator and 15 hours a week as the representative of the office and then 10 hours a week to support the guardianship program. Those are conflicts that we've now defined have to be remedied or um, removed um, to, you know, kind of support the effectiveness and credibility of the program. And I'd, I would also say that I've had uh, consumers call me, typically family members, and they, you know, to find me at the federal government, it's not always easy. And this is one of the things that they have identified as 
they see as a conflict when the ombudsman, at the, the representative at the local level uh, is wearing different hats. And, and they, they recognize that as a conflict. So it, it, you know, the appearance is there. Uh, at a minimum, and um, what does that, how does that impact, you know, your program, and what does that mean for residents, you know, if the ombudsman is also an APS worker, and I just did it myself when I said ombudsman, I meant to say when the representative of the office has different hats. Um, so the other thing is, say somebody was previously employed by a long-term care facility and they had a retirement plan and it was primarily comprised of company stock, that would be something that would be a prohibited conflict of interest. And so how would they divest their financial interests? What would be the reasonable time for them to do that? So again, you can look at other strategies to remedy and remove. It could be, um, you know, reassigning duties, removing conflicting duties. Those are some examples. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah in just a minute. But if you want more information to look at the rule, um, this link here is very long, but it is to the rule. Um, with the correct um, citation number. We went from 1327 to 1324, and this is laid out quite nicely by topic. It's easy to kind of scroll through um, by topic. We also have on the, ombuds, on the AOA ACL website, frequently asked questions, um, and there is one there related to conflicts of interest having to do with uh, a supervisor uh, who might have a conflict of interest and what to do there. So, um, and with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Louise. That was really good, thought-provoking information that you provided about the rule as well as the kinds of questions that have risen to your level and different ways of looking at them. One quick poll question before we move to the other two presentations. So just as soon as we open the poll, type in your response. The question is, has your program changed any of the practices or tools related to individual conflict of interest in response to the Ombudsman rule? So Katie, go ahead and open the poll. And if folks will key in their responses, We will ask Katie to, yes, Katie, you have a, yeah, move on to the responses and tell us what they are. Sorry about the disconnect. 53% said yes and 47% said no. Great. Well, that's kind of an interesting split. But we know that some programs were significantly, if not 100% compliant, with some of the provisions in the rule before the implementation of the rules. So maybe a number of programs had the good provisions already in place that meet the standards. With that, I would like to turn the presentation time over to Patty. So Patty, if you would share Texas information with us, please. Hi, folks. I'm going to talk to you about when we screen, how we screen, training on conflicts of interest, and how and when to remedy a conflict from the Texas perspective. So we're uh, required to screen when a person applies for a job or when they've applied to volunteer with the Ombudsman program here. Uh, before any contact with a resident, we require screening of conflicts of interest and pre before performing any of the functions of a representative of the office, that's required as well. Uh, the person believes they may have a conflict is another reason why we screen. So they uh, identify that they have had some kind of change in their life and the most common examples of that are a job change or adding new work in their, uh, in their daily life, uh, working after hours. And for volunteers uh, and staff, family job change or a circumstance with their family like moving into a long-term care facility is a very common reason. 
You're also required to screen in our state when the program believes the person may have a conflict. So some representatives may not recognize that a change in their life is a conflict of interest, but if they're talking to us and we become aware of it, then we have to initiate a screening. That's a staff responsibility. And then every year for current staff and volunteers, we're required to screen. Now we screen using a form with yes and no questions and that's one of the things that's different. Um, we updated our form recently based on the federal regulations and also based on a lot of experience we'd had where we didn't think we were capturing enough potential conflicts of interest with our, with our existing form. We associate time limits for some of our screening questions. So some of the questions are about only a current situation, like if you are acting or serving as a guardian of a person. Other questions are for all history of your, of your life, like we wanna know past employment with any long-term care facility, we wanna know that, regardless of when you worked for them. And other questions are looking back at about 12 months. So how long somebody worked as a surveyor or worked in a facility, as examples, that really affects how we might remedy it and how it might impact what length of time we want to apply a specific set of limitations um, to the person who's going to be acting as an ombudsman. So those time frames are really important, how long you worked someplace um, and how long it's been since you worked there are really important factors to getting good information so that we can make good decisions. We want details, um, and those details are really helpful to know the applicant's history. And Louise spoke to this, that we are, I'm sorry, I'm getting messages. Can I check in that people can hear me right now? Because I'm getting messages on my screen of audio problems. No, we can hear you just fine. Okay, okay good. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Louise talked about this, that Knowing and exploring the applicant's history here really helps us uh, also get at sort of the motivation for wanting to volunteer or work with the long-term care ombudsman program, and that helps us make good decisions. Um, it also really, for us, in my perspective, this is so much about program integrity and trust with the residents and the public and being a, an independent advocacy service for long-term care residents. And when we see someone with a conflict and we try to make it work, and it's not working, and we're forcing that, that tends to take focus off of residents and something that we really want to avoid. If the person answers no to all of our yes and no questions, in our state, our manager, our managing local ombudsman is what we call them, uh, signs off on the form and, and saves it in their, their certification file. But if the person answers yes, the, the managing local ombudsman is responsible for making sure there's enough information in our comment box on each of those yeses to understand what the history is. And then based on that information, the managing local ombudsman decides if a remedy or removal of the conflict is, is really possible. And they would submit, if they think it is possible, submit a remedy form to me, which I will approve or deny. So that first layer of decision making is really with our local manager. So it's important to train people on conflicts of interest, of course, and we do that using our form because those questions really help generate other questions and they pr provide sort of examples for discussion, um, typically in a group setting. And it really improves the likelihood that the form is gonna be filled out accurately. And those are all really critical to screening well about conflicts of interest. Uh, we need to train people about conflicts of interest requirements at the point they are applying for a job or applying to volunteer. But in the event that a volunteer didn't get screened right at application, the first time that they're coming in to meet with you for orientation training or maybe the first day of your certification training, we really feel strongly this has to be screened right up front. So this is, the, one of the reasons is it's a way to not waste time for the person who's applied and also for you in terms of training somebody who has a conflict that you really don't think there's a good way to resolve. But also conflict of interest screening is again that way to motiv identify motiv motivation of the person applying. 
when we train on this each year with volunteers and staff, it's important to give extra examples of conflicts that we've identified in the past. We've learned that making time for private discussion with the individual volunteers or staff, maybe, is really important to help people avoid embarrassment about a conflict of interest and to collect, on our end, to collect better information and base your decision on. So when somebody brings up, well, my family, you know, I've got a son who does this, you might explore that a little bit in a group setting, but then let them know that we'll talk about, you know, let's take some time to talk about that after we finish training today, so that the whole group learns a little about it, but that you can help someone kind of save face about the conflict, um, because sometimes they have a real moment of, whoa, I didn't realize that I, had, I was supposed to tell you about that. And they may be an experienced ombudsman. Here's when to remedy a conflict. So in our state, we say, before making a job offer to an applicant, so you have to screen. And if you're going to, to offer a job to them, you've got to find a remedy. Before a volunteer begins performing ombudsman functions, and then if it's a, a current volunteer or staff ombudsman, within five days of identifying a conflict, conflict with our managing local ombudsman, so that's like our local lead person, staff person, and everyone else at least within 30 days of identifying the conflict. And um, for a remedy, if the, the conflict can be sufficiently contained, um, so that means you can you can take care of the problem and uh, it doesn't create more work for you than is really worth it uh, is another reason when we would remedy a conflict of interest. Because there are times that you have to go to such lengths just to remedy a conflict that it may not be enough value added to the program, in our opinion. And finally, um, if the person with a conflict hasn't complied with your policies, so that may be largely about identifying and reporting a conflict of interest to you, but it could be other issues related to the person not being compliant with supervision or some other kind of problem um, related to policies and, and your expectations as a, as a local manager of the program. So after that conflict is identified, we have those time frames of five days for the manager and, and otherwise 30 days. During that time, we have the option of suspending the ombudsman from certain duties while we determine if and how a conflict can be achieved. Okay, so how to remedy, how we do it is we use a form. Um, and this is actually new. We, we used to have people kind of write a narrative to remedy and uh, with the new requirements about organizational conflicts of interest, we decided in my state that uh, a form that could be used for both types of conflicts remedying would be a better way to get a more comprehensive uh, look by the local programs at how they're going to accomplish removing the, removing the conflict or remedying it. So that form names the person with the conflict and describes the conflict. What is it? It identifies businesses and the people associated with those businesses. So um, it might be the corporate name of a facility and all the other facilities in the service area um, or the people who are involved with the family member who has a conflict of interest. The form requires you to explain what the ombudsman functions are that are affected by the conflict, and then to explain how each of those functions will be addressed differently or specifically in this case, and who will supervise those, uh, the oversight of the ombudsman performing those functions. And this is just a little bit more to say about how to remedy. Um, because how we remedy is greatly affected by where the ombudsman is placed. So, you know, where you're going to really function and perform your duties is um, really critical to remedying a problem. And if you have one assignment, one facility that you're assigned to, that's one kind of problem to solve. But if you have multiple facilities that you're assigned to, as mo most of our staff are, all of our staff, then you've got kind of a wider scope of the problem 
to look at. Uh, whether we can contain the conflict, I mentioned earlier, but for example, I wanted to give you this, uh, a previous job meant that you had contact with some residents in a long-term care facility. And so one way we think of trying to contain that history is what can we do to avoid the person who's now going to act as an ombudsman from having contact with those former clients because that would be the cleanest way to avoid uh, confusion by residents or family members or maybe even facility staff in terms of who you are and who you represent and the role you take as an ombudsman. Um, staff conflicts I mentioned a moment ago are, are just more complicated to resolve because they've got several facilities that you're going to be assigned to. Remedy plans here are going to be very scrutinized by me. Uh, I expect our managing ombudsman to fully explore the potential problems, think 10 steps down the, the line, and plan ahead for them. Um, I tend to allow some remedies in rural or remote areas that I would strongly discourage in a met metropolitan or a suburban area. But even if I'm more lenient about rural settings, um, it is still subject to very careful oversight. And I only allow it as long as the situation is working. If it starts to not work any longer, um, uh, the ombudsman is performing you know, dual roles or um, not being the advocate that she needs to be, then everyone's forewarned that the person will be reassigned or certification will be removed. So you know, my feeling is we really want to hold tight to those reins on remedy plans because it's only as good as us implementing them as intended. So that wraps up my quick portion, and I'm going to turn it over to Stacy in Toledo, Ohio. Hi, Stacy. Hi, thank you very much. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, I am with the Ombudsman Program, a regional program in Toledo, Ohio. We cover 10 counties in Northwest Ohio containing both urban and rural areas. Our program currently has seven ombudsman staff and 38 volunteer ombudsmen. Um, and we cover a total of 272 long-term care facilities. And in Ohio, we also advocate on behalf of consumers of home and community-based services, as well as consumers of MyCare Ohio, a demonstration project which provides managed care for individuals duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. So like many ombudsman programs, resources are often tight, and ensuring program excellence in all ombudsman core services requires efficient and effective use of our program staff and volunteers. Conflict of interest screening has helped me manage several aspects of our daily program operations. It allows me to ensure proper staff and volunteer assignment of duties and core service activities. So prior to hiring an ombudsman staff position, we require that any candidate selected for an interview arrive at the interview with a completed conflict of interest screen. Um, and this, the screening form we use was provided to you as part of the handout. Um, I will compare the screen to the candidate's resume. Um, as I have on occasion found discrepancies, then the interview provides me with an opportunity to clarify any identified discrepancies as well as learn more about identified conflicts of interest. Sometimes candidates fail to identify a former place of employment on their resume if uh, they were there for a short time or left under questionable circumstances. The conflict of interest screen helps provide a more complete employment history and enables me to determine whether the program can work with a candidate's conflict. So prior to offering an ombudsman staff position to a qualified candidate, uh, I submit the completed conflict of interest screen, screen um, to our state ombudsman with any proposed remedies or requests for waivers. The remedies can include proposing the ombudsman staff person will not perform any core ombudsman services with the identified long-term care provider, um, if the conflict of interest was employment with a provider, we would not permit the ombudsman to handle anything associated with that provider. The ombudsman would not investigate complaints, offer provider consultations, conduct regular presence visits, et cetera. Other potential conflicts of interest include an immediate family member receiving services from a long-term care provider, 
or an immediate family member employed by a long-term care provider. We would uh, propose a similar remedy of not permitting the ombudsman to handle any core services with that provider for the length of time that conflict of interest exists. A waiver may be requested if I believe the conflict of interest is no longer a conflict. So examples of this might include when there has been a change in ownership or management of the long-term care provider or the conflict of interest occurred so long ago that it's no longer a likely conflict. Um, the state ombudsman or state ombudsman would request an explanation uh, to determine whether the circumstances exist to approve a waiver request. Um, we implement a similar process to screen uh, for conflicts of interest with potential volunteers. Um, our region is fortunate in that we have a full-time volunteer coordinator. As part of our recruitment, the volunteer coordinator conducts an informal uh, phone interview of the potential volunteer, during which she can often learn of possible conflicts of interest. Prior to allowing the potential volunteer to participate in ombudsman certification training, we do require the conflict of interest screen be completed. Remedies and waivers are suggested and requested as warranted upon submission of the screen to the state ombudsman. Um, unfortunately, we've had to turn uh, some very qualified potential volunteers away due to identified conflicts of interest, um, such as being actively empo employed by a long-term care provider. Um, our regional program is housed within our area's legal aid law firm. Board members of our host agency are also required to complete a conflict of interest screen as they are responsible for oversight of the agency and play a role in hiring the ombudsman program director. Any board member with an identified conflict of interest is removed from any vote pertaining to the long-term care ombudsman program. Conflicts of interest that are identified with board members often include uh, immediate family members receiving services from a long-term care provider or board members with a financial interest in a long-term care provider. One example of a board member with an identified conflict of interest is an attorney who works at a firm which represents long-term care providers. So our region conducts annual conflict of interest screens with staff, volunteers, and board members. During this process, we often identify new conflicts and can request waivers if former conflicts of interest no longer exist. Examples of new conflicts of interest I've identified uh, during annual screening process include learning that a spouse of a volunteer is receiving long-term care services, um, an immediate family member of a staff ombudsman has been hired and is employed by a long-term care provider, or a volunteer ombudsman's sister is a beautician with a nursing home in our region. So other ways our uh, conflict of interest screening process has helped the program include um, knowing when to exclude a staff ombudsman candidate or potential volunteer ombudsman from consideration. Having several years of experience working with multiple long-term care providers or one provider owned by a corporation of multiple providers is not necessarily beneficial to becoming an ombudsman. Our program has received conflicts of interest screen, um, screens which indicate an individual has worked for many of the providers in a certain area in which he or she lives. I need to consider where can the program utilize this person as an ombudsman. Does the program want to expend resources assigning this person to another area, resulting in added travel time and mileage expenses? Um, also, if we see that a, maybe a potential volunteer has identified a close family member currently residing in a nursing home, it forces us to ask questions about that experience which at times has revealed motives for wanting to become an ombudsman that would be a detriment to the program. Uh, we may consider other ways to utilize a volunteer in that position, maybe um, in using it, them as a clerical assistant or asking them to visit uh, adult care facilities um, rather than nursing homes. So this is just a brief overview of you know, how our region operates and implements the conflict of interest screening process. We have our, our Ohio rule and statute to refer to when questioning whether a conflict of interest exists. And our state ombudsman provides um, technical assistance with any questions we may have when making these determinations. And the slide that's on the screen right now does have the links to both um, our rule and statute for the state of Ohio. Um, I appreciate your time, and I, I hope this uh, was useful information. Thank you so much, and I think uh, I'm to turn it back over to Sarah. 
Thank you, Stacy. We really appreciate that. And thanks to Patty also. So let me see. We have a few minutes now to t have questions and comments, and I know that one or two of you have sent in some questions via chat. So let's open the discussion. So if you have questions, feel free to type it into chat, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute your line, perhaps. And I know that we've had one question that came in already. I don't know if, um, Carol, if you want to pose it or if the person who typed it into chat wants to. Well, I'd be happy to read it. It says, as a local long-term care program director, I nominated a volunteer ombudsman for recognition, and they were selected to receive a valuable prize, a cruise. In addition, as the nominator, I received a certificate to redeem for a product provided by the company worth $25. Is there a conflict of interest that should be identified to the state ombudsman for review. So Louise or Patty or Sarah, and unmute yourself if you're talking because I can't hear you. Uh, OK, this is Louise. And I guess I, I have a few more questions about the details, but I would say if there's if it ever comes into your mind should I ask the state ombudsman if this is a conflict the answer is yes just when in doubt ask um, doesn't hurt to just double check um, and I think I'm, it's not clear where this uh, prize came from and where the the you know what was the organization that was nominated you know so I mean, I'm assuming it was not some kind of long-term care facility association or something like that. If it was, that would be a problem, and um, that would not be an area uh, organization you would want to nominate a volunteer to for some kind of um, big prize. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think though you do want to. Uh -huh. I was going to say, in this case, it, it's a company that is. Um, is not affiliated with directly with nursing homes and they are promoting volunteerism of all kinds um, not just mm -hmm. long-term care not just ombudsman mm -hmm. so th this was kind of a competitive um, you know nominate a volunteer and this company mm -hmm. um, which sells products um, chose chose the ombudsman mm -hmm. yeah Okay, and I guess, you know, then, you know, I would also wonder, well, what kind of products, you know, do they sell products to long-term care facilities? So those are things, for those reasons, I think it's wise to run it by your state ombudsman. Um, and I think in terms of a $25 gift, you know, what does your state program say about accepting gifts? Um, what you know, is there a, you know, do they have a value limit? You know, $25 is not a huge chunk of money in terms of a, of a gift. Um, but again, there might be some state um, ombudsman policy, program policies that come into effect. You might also have some agency policies um, that as an employee of a certain type of agency, there might be some restrictions. So that would be another um, question. Um, so I would have. But okay, I would say, thank you. short answer, yes, talk to your state ombudsman. OK, great, thank you. Um, the next question is, the rule mentions that a person cannot be a guardian for an individual in a service area. How is service area defined? So service area would be if, say, your state has local entity programs. That could be one way service area is defined. Um, it could be if your state is centralized, but staff are assigned to parts of the state. That could be another way. So that's kind of generally, I think, how that is intended. Um, OK, thank you. Um, the third question is, can a person 
that is living at a continuing care retirement community become a volunteer ombudsman for the nursing home in, in their community? That is a good question. So Louise, this is Patty. I'll jump in and tell yeah. you what Great. we think in Texas. Uh, we've great. had this come up in Texas, and we have come to the conclusion first that a resident of a long-term care facility, nursing home and assisted living, uh, has a conflict trying to serve as the ombudsman for the community in which they live. Um, and I'm kind of surprised how many residents have actually asked us over the years to be their, to be an ombudsman where they live. Uh, but also, we would apply this to a person living in independent living, serving as the nursing home or assisted living uh, ombudsman on the same campus. And we just we just feel like there too, there's too much opportunity for um, the person trying to serve as the ombudsman to to feel conflicted by the relationship they have uh, living on that campus feeling potentially being co-opted by the ownership of the facilities uh, of the campus to you know kind of be the, the mouthpiece of the facilities or putting themselves in jeopardy and wanting to avoid being in jeopardy of their own living arrangements by standing up and serving as an advocate. And that is certainly well beyond what the rules say at the federal level, but it's a decision we've made at the state level because as I said kind of earlier, you know, there's some point where the problems you're dealing with related to somebody's situation in life take the focus off of residents, and that's a point in time where, where we don't want to have a person acting as an ombudsman any longer in our program. Great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Personal or family membership in the Assisted Living Association or Nursing Home Association. Conflict? Did you say it again? Personal or family membership in the Assisted Living Association or Nursing Home Association. So you're, you or a family member belong to the State Trade Association. So that's a conflict. Um, and that would I be agree. one that would be considered um, prohibited um, has, uh, let's see, where is that? Well, uh, you know what, let me see here. I think it might be in the act. Um, anyhow, that is prohibited. Okay, because, you know, we do have some you know, state or local ombudsman that might have a license to be a licensed administrator. So that's not necessarily uh, a, a problem. It's when they join an association and therefore their membership in that association is a, is a problem. Okay, so thank you. On the next one, should the local agencies that employ the local representatives consider revising job descriptions to include a reference to the exclusion of conflict of interest so that prospective applicants are informed when considering applying for or accepting the position. So in other words, should the enti local entity revise their job descriptions to include conflict of interest provisions so that people who are thinking about applying might say, oops, I'm not eligible, or oops, I need to inform you of something. Well, this is Patty. I'd like to hear from Stacy too, but um, I know that I um, had my job description as the state long-term care ombudsman revised after the federal regulation uh, to include a reference, a specific reference to uh, being free of conflicts of interest as a condition of maintaining employment and being employable. Um, so they had, if there's a conflict, I mean, it's written in such a way that a conflict may exist that can be remedied, um, but that was added to my job description 
So I do see that as a reasonable thing to edit within the local offices um, and state offices, but um, but also I see it as almost more of a job posting issue because if you can tell people applying for a job with you that they will be screened for conflicts of interest as well as other things, you might likely screen for criminal history or um, other other background. So that makes sense to me and that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. And and this is Stacy. Um, I, I agree. I, I would just be careful in terms of not wanting to lose out on some qualified candidates because maybe their interpretation of conflict of interest isn't necessarily what it happens to be. So I think at least making them aware that um, it's subject to a screening for conflicts of interest. Um, and that's part of our policy, not necessarily our job description, um, but I, I can see where it would be beneficial. Great, thank you. Um, if you have a neighbor or close friend in a facility, is that considered a conflict? Uh, this is Stacy. Um, in some of our rural areas, it's hard not to run into your neighbor or people you know or went to high school with and that type of thing. Um, while we don't, it, it doesn't meet the strict definition um, of conflict of interest, I um, talk with my ombudsman about what their level of comfort is in that situation. Um, I know that, you know, if you know, if it's a close family friend, most of the time they're not going to be comfortable being the ombudsman assigned to handle um, a situation that may involve them. And so we would um, look to reassign, um, you know, that task to another staff person or, or volunteer or whatever. So, um, and you're not always going to know until you show up at the facility or, you know, you receive the phone call. But um, my staff and volunteers are aware that, you um, you know, if anything like that presents itself, we need to have a discussion about it, and then we will um, proceed from there. And, and if we need to, we can seek direction from our state office. Um, Carol, if I could add to that, this is Patty, and uh, we characterize, the, we ask the question of whether you're a, a primary decision maker for anyone living in a long-term care facility, and so. I would say a close friend or a neighbor, unless you're acting as their guardian, their power of attorney, or other formal or, or even informal decision maker, that would be where we would see a conflict of interest. And depending on the situation, maybe that one individual is carved out of your role as the ombudsman for the facility, but um, more likely we, we would not place an ombudsman in that facility, much more likely. Um, maybe if they were already there and then a neighbor moves in, um, we might look at that situation a little differently. Thank I you. I think that's kind of what you were referring to earlier, um, Patty, when you mentioned that sometimes in a rural area um, there might be something that you might allow there that you wouldn't allow in a uh, more urban area because one of the other comments that came in was, if I'm a guardian of a family member in a, in a facility, then can I be an ombudsman in another facility in the same town? And that would, that would be permissible, um, correct? In, in my experience, that's something we permit. And we are talking about an individual acting as a guardian, so not a private professional guardian who will have multiple clients, that sort of thing, yes. Okay. Was someone else about ready to jump in? Oh, this is Louise. I was just going to say that these examples are ones, you know, like the close friend who moves into a long-term care facility or, you know, I'm a guardian for my aunt or, you know, those things. They're ones that are more common and are, I, I would just say rule of thumb, are those are ones you want to, if you don't have a hard and fast kind of policy and procedure on some of these gray area ones, that these are, 
always good to talk to the to your state ombudsman about and um, you know kind of just bat around ideas and you know Patty and um, Stacy have both given um, good examples of how they um, look at those and how they um, you know kind of have some remedies there so okay and our last um comment that's come in um, was back to the uh, continuing care uh, resident who wanted to uh, become an ombudsman. Um, if the person did, well, would not be assigned to the CCRC's nursing home, but would volunteer in another facility. So this would be a resident of one nursing home going, or I'm sorry, uh, not necessarily the resident nursing home, but someone living in a CCRC who would be assigned to a, an outside nursing home or assisted living. Any comments there? Yeah, want me to keep being the one to talk about this one? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll just say that does feel different to me because it takes out those considerations that I had given to you as concerns, possible concerns. Um, I will say if it were a person living in a nursing facility wanting to volunteer in another nursing facility or, or let's say a long-term care facility in another long-term care facility, I, I still likely would really scrutinize this as the state ombudsman in that I worry about <sighs> I worry about the motivation of the person wanting to serve as an ombudsman and whether it is in any way intended to intimidate um, the facility in which you live. And the example we got was somebody living in the independent living and that's probably, that, that, that kind of takes that off the table. But that would be something else I would be thinking about. So that's my full answer. Mm -hmm. Great, and I think we can all go back to what uh, Louise just said that if in doubt, um, talk to your state ombudsman, look over your rules. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over, uh, turn the mic over to Sarah for um, some other information. Great. Thanks, Carol. This has been quite a lively discussion. Sarah? So I'm looking at the time, and I think we will do one quick poll situation and then move on into the resources and other things you can see that will be coming soon. So here's the situation for you to weigh in on, is it a conflict of interest or not? Mrs. Rivera wants to volunteer in the only facility in her county. Her mother lived in that facility until she passed away six months ago. Mrs. Rivera says that she wants to continue helping other residents who live there. So just based on this, not all those other things that we've been discussing you'd like to know, is this a conflict of interest, yes or no? And Katie has the poll open. So this is another time when it's pretty evenly divided. I think we'll close the poll. So 54% of you say yes, and 46% of you are saying no. And I'm sure you all are thinking we would have those good conversations that Stacy and Patty talked about, trying to explore motivations and beginning to find out additional information before you make a straight off the bat determination. But before I move into resources, I'm just wondering if Louise, Patty, or Stacy have anything that, any tips that you want to provide that you for sure would ask about in this situation. Well, this is Louise, and I guess I would just say, you know, you can identify a conflict that's one question, you, you know, you identify it, and then, you know, again, can, can it be remedied or removed? That's another question. And so I, I think it's, I guess I would say, err when, when you're not sure, err on the side of conflict because it gives you more opportunity to explore rather than just 
sometimes say, no, it's not a conflict when, you know, if, if there's any kind of, any question, um, you know, having a conflict doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a bad thing or a thing that means a person can't be a representative of the office. But again, you've got to explore it. I bet Stacy will agree with me. This is Patty. I think how long her mother lived there and, and what the experience was like is a big factor here. And I also just think about grief. And six months isn't a long time um, since mm -hmm. losing your mother. And so those would be questions that I would really expect the local ombudsman to explore fully with somebody applying under those circumstances. Yeah, I, this is Stacy. I agree. And I think um, we automatically go to, does she have an ax to grind with the facility? But I think we also need to look at the um, other side as to, you know, maybe she loves this facility and thought it was um, just wonderful. And, you know, what does that do then um, if she's the ombudsman in a facility? Does that mean she's going to be more provider oriented than uh, resident oriented? So. Um, there's a lot to consider in these situations. Well, so right. thank you. And I'm looking at the time. I know that we can go you know, a few minutes past the stated cutoff time for this webinar so that we can run through some resources. But it seems to me that the tips that the three of you have given are really good kinds of ticklers for people to run through if they have a situation situation similar to this. The other thing that I wanted to mention is something that Louise brought out in her presentation. The rule is silent on whether or not on any kind of time frame for having employment in a facility and the same thing having a family member in the facility except of course their employment there's cooling off period that we is our shorthand for referring to it for the state ombudsman, but none in the rules specified for local ombudsman or representatives of the office. However, states may impose their own additional requirements. So, for instance, a state could have something in place that says family members in this situation cannot be ombudsman, long-term care ombudsman, or representatives of the office of the ombudsman until X amount of time has passed. So there are different ways that programs can come up with additional requirements if they so choose. I want to zoom kind of quickly through some other points. We had a few other scenarios that will be kind of teasers because we won't pull on those today, but I will mention these when we get to resources. So there are a number of resources, of course. On the NORC website, you can access a link to the Older Americans Act. You can also link to the rule and some resources in the rule. We have a hot off the press, literally, very recently released issue brief on considerations for identifying and addressing individual conflicts of interest. This is a handy dandy and one place, nine page document that provides some real ticklers. You can see down under policies and procedures some key questions to ask around the provisions in the rule regarding individual conflict of interest. And also you will find the specific language in the Older Americans Act and in the rule that pertain to individual conflicts of interest in this document. So you don't have to pull out multiple files and open a number of different tabs on your screen to be able to flip back and forth and see, okay, what are the provisions that are covered here? Coming soon, you'll see under the coming soon section, we will have some other tips, a checklist, some best practices, and some of the key questions to consider when you're trying to weigh factors. We have additional resources posted on the website, and soon we will post these linked to them under the webinar resources. But you see that there are conflict of interest in the long-term care ombudsman program. There's a resource paper that was done a few years ago, but the substance of it is still spot on, and some ideas that states came up with in terms of remedies and decision-making criteria are still current. We have a 
thinking piece paper on included in the long-term care ombudsman strategy session on conflict of interest. There are two briefs actually that cover the conflict of interest in those appendices. So if you're trying to think about updating your policies, you may want to pull those out and just read them and see if there are additional ideas or tools that come to mind. Then the seminal work by the Institute of Medicine, Real People, Real Problems, and Evaluation of the Programs of the Old Americans Act has a whole chapter on conflict of interest. And this was done back in the 90s, but I can tell you many of the issues they raise and scenarios that, they, that are provided in that chapter are still on point. And I know that some of the situations raised in that chapter around is this a conflict or not? How might consumers view it? How might it come back to help or detract from the credibility of the program are some of the same kinds of questions that Louise was alluding to when she said consumers call her. Self-evaluation continuous improvement tool. We have one for the state level, statewide program, and one for local programs. It has, but each of those have whole sections on conflict of interest that may help you think more sharply or just be a safety net, are there key things that maybe you need to incorporate in your conflict of interest screening? We also have a compilation of policies and procedures from the states, and we have created a chart around conflict of interest provisions, and you can see some of the headings in the chart. If you will, please, please, please send us your newest screening tools and policies and procedures, we'll be able to update the resources and I think everyone can gain from that because, as Patty indicated, they have changed. Texas has changed some of their policy, some of their screening instruments and processes in direct response to the rule. And we know that a number of other states are doing the same thing. Lastly, I want to give you a plug for another webinar that's coming up in about a month on volunteer management. We will cover model materials and sharing of best practices. You can register for that currently, and it's really targeted toward volunteer ombudsmen and managing the ombudsman representatives of the office who are volunteers. So we encourage you to jump on and register for that if you haven't already. Lastly, we just want to give another thanks, hearty, hearty thanks to Carol and Katie and Amity for all their behind the scenes work in pulling this together and many of the logistics and materials. And a really big round of applause figuratively to Louise, Patty, and Stacy for sharing wonderful foundation and materials as well as good practices and your tools that you're using, how you apply those. And to all of you who have tuned in to ask questions to help us refine what we do and join us all in collaborative learning. So with that, we will end the recording and wrap up the webinar. And thank you so much for your interest in this topic.